This is Sen from Soul Blonde, and you're listening to the new scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I'm your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And on the show this week, we've got Jesse Mathewson of Ken Mode, and we cover everything, their origins in Winnipeg, all the years they took a run at being a full-time touring band, the music management business that Jesse is running with his brother and bandmate. It's a great conversation. We cover a whole lot of topics, and that's coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Five-star reviews. Did you know that you can leave five-star reviews for the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify? And did you know that you can write a review on Apple Podcasts? Give us a five-star review if you like the show and haven't done it yet. And if you write a nice review on Apple Podcasts, I'll read it on the air. And shirts. We've got long sleeve shirts. We've got short sleeve shirts. Head over to Death Wish Inc. and pick one up. Just search the new scene. You'll see the fine selection of shirts at Death Wish Inc. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. The second pressing of the 30th anniversary edition of Quicksand's landmark album, Slip is available right now. Did you miss out on the first pressing? Did you not get your hands on this highly coveted record? Well, there's a second pressing up, so get it quick before it's gone, and it will be gone. I mean, it's slip, for God's sake. Jerome's Dream just premiered a new single, South by Isolation, and that's streaming everywhere. You have to listen to that. You just have to. For more information, head on over to iodinerecordings.com or the iodine instagram at iodine recordings and don't forget to support this month's sponsor bridge nine records you got to stop by the record store you just have to they have it all they have it all you know all the bands that are on bridge nine every band you've ever heard of in the scene has been on bridge nine records the record store is at 282 rantoul street in Beverly, Massachusetts. It's open every Wednesday through Sunday, starting at 11 a.m. They've got records, they've got shirts, they've got other merch, they've got Bridge Nine records, they've got other punk and hardcore releases. They've got it all. Also, Bridge Nine is doing record auctions on Instagram. Follow B9 Auctions. The bidding takes place in the comment sections of the posts, and you can get your hands on some rare vinyl, even if you can't make it out to the store. For more information, head to bridge9.com. That's bridge, the number 9.com. Or check out their Instagram at bridge9. That's bridge, N-I-N-E. Okay. So listen, check back in with me in segment three. I'll tell you about some top secret things I'm up to this weekend. We'll do a music recommendation. We'll talk about everything that's going on. And there's a lot going on, as always. But right now, we are going to speak to Jesse Mathewson of Ken Mode. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Jesse Mathewson. Jesse, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes, Jesse, it's wonderful to have you here. You know, you've done a whole lot over the years with Ken Mode. You've given us a lot of great music. You have your own business now. You're up to a lot. And we're going to cover all of that, Jesse. But first, let me ask you how are you doing today? Today's not so bad. I'm lately feeling very exhausted all the time. <laughs> but I feel like everyone is all the time the older we get, so that's nothing special. I think that's just the way it goes. How old are you? I am 41 years young. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I just turned 41. Wait, I just turned 40 years young around this time last year, and I will be 41 years young soon. And... I feel tired all the time. I think maybe that's some like post-COVID stuff or from being inside all the time. Maybe we haven't all fully recovered. People tell me that. 
Uh, but most of the time, I don't feel my age. What about you? I, I I I agree with you completely on that. I don't feel like I necessarily feel my age, but post COVID, I am certainly more tired all the time, and. I don't know whether part of that's because I'm just not in the same kind of shape I was beforehand or whether I'm just psychologically exhausted. I can't really say, but I definitely do feel like those stupid few years took a a toll that none of us really understood at the time. And it's only really, I mean, scientists knew and psychologists knew, but I don't think anyone else experiencing it was necessarily prepared for the fallout. I agree with you completely, and I forget that until I talk to people like yourself, Jesse, on this show, because I'm doing my thing, I'm in my room, I'm working on stuff constantly, and I'm like, why do I feel like shit? Why don't I like to go out as much as I used to? And it's like, dude, you were inside for two years. Everybody was. No one knew what the hell was going on. That probably takes a toll that we're not aware of. And everyone was busy fighting online, which is is really good for all of us. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Oh, man. Like, look, I understand some of it was for safety stuff, but I just remember people bickering about masks or like outside. Like if you weren't wearing a mask outside, you'd be crucified and then things were opening back up. And if you did something too early, you were crucified and just fighting, fighting, fighting. Most of that seems to be over, and I'm happy about it. You know, I don't even really look at Twitter anymore because that's like the place to go if you want to read a bunch of bickering. I just post and leave. That's it. Yeah, I feel, uh, I mean, anywhere, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it, that's where people are bickering about it still, still. (laughs) And I am so goddamn sick of it. I didn't even really, because I'm still kind of like, adjacent to a martial arts community i didn't realize that this was going on until recently but apparently like there's been some athletes that have either one in the martial arts community uh she's suspected to have killed herself but anti-vaxxers are claiming that the covid vaccine killed her and apparently this is happening anytime any athlete dies now that whole community is crying vaccine killed them they died because of that no no one ever died before and uh <laughs> i just Every time stuff like that creeps into my uh, stratosphere, I, I I am thankful that it took this long to get there because it just it reminds me how much I hate everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you on that. Oh, the the vaccine is killing people. Crowd are very interesting. You know, I'll see I'll be on Instagram or wherever, and I'll see someone post like a podcast link and be like, you have to see this. And I'm like, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> do not we have go. to see it. Do not <laughs> ever have to see it. Yeah. And everyone will be like, oh, do, don't you do your research? Don't you do your research? It's like, no, but I'm not going to do your research, whatever that is. You're not doing it either. Trust me. None of you know what research <laughs> is. Research is? Are you- see, I don't think I can even speak properly since the pandemic. <laughs> you, you go through two years of barely speaking to anyone. You kind of have to retrain all that too. I feel like I've like, got like a mild stutter and lisp all just because of being inside for that long yeah i'm i'm still adjusting back but uh i'm outside a lot more which is great uh and uh i don't know do you think we'll ever feel totally normal again i'm talking like i'm 2019 before the whole thing i went to a lot more shows i would go to shows by myself which seems crazy now (laughs) and I just, I don't know, I would do a lot more stuff. I can't see myself ever getting back to that, especially now because, you know, I'll be 41 soon. What about you, Jesse? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I like to think I can, but like, yeah, I don't know. There's there's some uh, psychological baggage that needs to be unpacked for sure. I, I And I, I bitched about this all the way through our album cycle. Like, I I feel like I put in a ton of work over the last decade and a half to like, make myself a better and more chilled out person. And the pandemic undid like 10 years worth of work. And I am (laughs) back to being just as frustrated and filled with angst as I was in my 20s. Only now I'm in my 40s and my body and brain can't take it. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I probably should be in therapy. (laughs) So what's the solution? Therapy? Are you going to try therapy? Is there anything else you do? I don't know. I've done therapy in the past. I don't really... I want to try and do as many things to not have to do it now because there's some of it that I feel is just mildly chemical and situational. Others, I know I need to get myself into better physical shape 
back to kind of where I was before the pandemic. Cause I do know some of those habits have just been shattered. So fixing that would help. Cause I used to probably work out seven days a week and now maybe three. Uh, and it's just, you get, I get stuck in cycles and I, I'm sure like everyone's like this, you get comfortable in a certain cycle and breaking that is difficult. So I, uh, I've acknowledged that I, I need to do more of the things that make me feel better, but it's hard to get back into the routine, routine, especially when you need to be in shape to do the things that you want to do. Yeah. Seven days a week working out. What are we talking here? Weights or running or what do you, what did you do? What do you do? I, I go to a Muay Thai gym. So a lot of the time I was just there like six days a week. And on the off day, I'd like hit the elliptical just for something to keep the blood flowing. Um, but yeah, I, I need to start doing some weights because I know I have uh, some injuries that would be better rehabbed if I had a proper weight routine. And I know the importance of doing even like, I don't know, endurance weight training as you get older and older. Like that's one of the big things that kills people is their their muscles degenerate. And that's how a lot of people fall, how they hurt themselves. And and it's 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 very important to like longevity, physical longevity to to maintain strength. Um, and it's just not really a part of my, my day to day. So I I know I got to fix that. Yeah. So you have your own business now, correct? You do accounting and other managerial tasks for bands. Do I have that correct? That is correct. Yeah. My brother and I started doing that full time, probably in early 2016 when we kind of burnt out on touring all the time. I, I don't specifically do a ton of accounting myself anymore. Um, but I, I still do some. We, we kind of handle a, a gamut of business management uh, things that bands need. And it's, it's, it's I mean, a, a lot of what my actual degree was in was in marketing and small business management. So that's, that's kind of why we've gravitated toward what we do. And also just all the things that we've kind of naturally done for our own band. Now we're doing them for bands that actually make money. <laughs> <laughs> Shane is a proper accountant, like he's a chartered accountant or CPA in the US and now Canada followed suit and called them CPAs. But yeah, he he can handle the tax side and all that unfun stuff. Um, a lot of my time ends up actually getting consumed with doing grant writing and, and work like that for a lot of Canadian bands. And it's, I don't know, it's just something that I found myself doing because it's it's a it's a niche that's very needed, especially in the metal and hardcore communities in Canada. So I, I take care of quite a few bands with that, and it fills a lot of my time. Nice. So you own the company with your brother, Shane? That is correct. And you guys are in Ken mode together too, right? That is also correct. So you're performing together, you're working together. How is that? Any Is there ever any uh, brotherly eruptions or uh, disagreements? Oh, there can be from time to time, certainly. For the most part, we work together pretty well. Um, we have separate offices now, though, so uh, I think that's probably why it works better. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't blast him out of the the room with black and death metal anymore. So he he has a tendency to like to work either in silence or with podcasts. So you know, very very different working styles. Oh yeah, yeah. I was at a. Uh... I was at Christmas dinner with my family, and I was there with my brother, and I was like, "Remember when we shared the same room for like ten years?" How did we do that? Yeah, like <laughs> necessity. But when it's <laughs> when it's all you know, it's all you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm curious about you know transitioning from full time grind Ken mode into this business. Now Ken mode was going hard from wait from 2000 probably 11 to 2016, right? Like yeah, full time. That's when we were full time. We kind of started setting the the groundwork for all that in 2009 ish. But we were still holding down day jobs from 2009 and 2010. But we, we definitely did a, a couple U.S. tours in 2010 just to to get ourselves back in that whole world and making people aware of us because that, that was kind of the, the biggest thing that I felt was always holding us back. Like we're from the middle of nowhere in Canada and we play an obscure type of extreme noise rock. And like, why would anyone pay attention unless we're out there in people's faces all the time like it's not exactly commercial music even within the community it's not popular like the most popular bands from that world really ever were like today's a day unsane stuff like that and especially in the early 2000s to to mid 
to nearing 2010s, like nobody was really doing that that had a profile anymore. So we just, we never wanted to look back and go like, what if we tried? What if we tried? And, and I mean, I feel like it kind of paid off. Like uh, at this point, I feel like we're more popular than we deserve to be. And it's mostly just because we pounded the pavement as hard as we did. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're setting the stage to do this full time. Talk about doing it full time. I mean, are you just doing the band? How are you making money between tours? Are you out on the road constantly? Tell us a little bit about that time. Yeah, we tried to be on on the road all the time. That was the the whole point. Um, Shane and I both saved up some money before embarking on this whole thing because we knew like we're not going to make very much money. You should have a pad to at least survive off of for a year. And somehow we were able to extend that to like five years. Some of it was we were, were fortunate enough to be Canadians and there are some funds available to bands who know how to acquire them. And we, we did get some to make it so we we didn't completely decimate our savings. But for the most part, yeah, like we, we approached it intelligently. We 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 didn't have uh, delusions of entitlement. We didn't think we'd make a ton of money. It was basically just a rock and roll fantasy camp that lasted five years. Do you think it was worth it? Are you happy with the results? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, as like I just said, uh, I, I believe we're more popular than our style deserves. So, um, especially as we've continued to tour while now working full time, like things continue to get better, which is strange. And, and I mean, that's the thing we kind of acknowledge every time we go out that it could go one of two ways: uh, nobody gives a shit, or it does okay, or maybe better but we generally don't think it's gonna be better so whenever that happens it's a surprise to us so it's like our expectation is it'll probably be the same or maybe worse and if it's worse we have to reevaluate whether we do it again so it's nice when we find out oh we made a little bit more money than the last time we sold a little more records on this record than the one before we sold more t-shirts that's cool people didn't hate it (laughs) That's good. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very smart approach to the whole thing. More, Just looking at it realistically. More artists should follow that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can consult them via your business and they'll listen to you. Possibly, possibly. Although a lot of the time yeah. they just don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the band was around a long time, even before 2011. You, your first LP came out in 2003, yes? Yeah, yeah, on Escape Artist Records. Yeah, and we we formed in 1999 when we were literally still just children. How old were you when the band formed? Um, when we went by Ken mode, I was 17. Yeah, 17 and Shane wow. was 15. And yeah, I'm 41 now, so. <laughs> wow, so literal children, yes. Yeah, I know, like we made our first record when Shane was still 18. How old was he? 17, maybe? Anyway. Go ahead. Talk about the band coming together. You're young, you're in high school still. I like Ken Mode because it doesn't exactly sound like everything else necessarily. You know, when I think of 1999, 2000, there's a lot of chaotic metal core stuff going on. That's good. You have Cole S, you have Botch, you have Dillinger, there's all that stuff. There's a melodic metal core thing popping up. You have Poison the Well and all that type of stuff. And then, of course, there's your pop punk and emo stuff. But Ken Mode, doesn't really fit into that. It's like the it's like the cooler, noisier, more experimental side of things. So talk about that time, the band coming together, what you're into, what you're looking to do. Yeah, we were very much influenced by a lot of the more messed up noise rock scene of the kind of earlier to mid nineties. But at the same time when we formed Ken Mode, like you were mentioning, the chaotic kind of metalcore scene was really reaching its pinnacle near the end of the 90s, early aughts. And that that had an undeniable influence on us at the time in terms of the fact that everyone that was like metalcore and hardcore adjacent seemed to be writing songs that had like 15 to 20 riffs each. So we weren't immune to that disease, but (laughs) we were basically taking like Unsane and Zenny Giva riffs and doing like speeding them up and playing them like with 20 different parts. So... It was it was certainly its its own beast, although a part of kind kind of a part of a scene that was existing. I don't know. Even reflecting back, like 
I I don't feel like we really necessarily sounded like anyone. We ha- you could hear the the inklings of of things that were going on like Mastodon and Dillinger Escape Plan while at the same time it's because we had similar influences going into it even though we we're younger than all those people but and I think part of that helped us in kind of branching out from those scenes as time went on and when we started touring a lot flash forward to like 2009 2010 2011 like our sound no one had really heard anything like that in the last decade so i think that's why it didn't come across as too throwbacky and probably why what we're doing now albeit are constantly shifting and changing our sound which is probably also contributes to why we're not just considered like a throwback band but yeah, I, I, it, it's probably the, the fact that it's still working is because we've never really had anything that latched on. <laughs> it's never been cool, so it still <laughs> kind of works. And I know that was something that Buzz from the Melvins always said. The big thing is just never have a hit. Never have a hit. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I respect uh, being that young and coming up with something so unique you know, and just the influences you've named today is the day unseen, all of that stuff. Because, you know, when I was young, I I just would be like, I want to sound like X band and X band was usually like really big and had a very specific sound. But you guys were like onto something else already at such a young age. Yeah, I, I was kind of fortunate that I am like, well, timing wise, I'm, I'm, I guess considered right at the very beginning of the the millennial generation, but culturally speaking, was very much still on the Gen X side. So, like, I was right at the tail end of of like the whole grunge movement. Um, but I was like twelve when that was all falling apart. But because of that, I, I through bands like Nirvana um, got into punk and hardcore through bands like Black Flag and the Melvins and and I ended up making friends with people that were 10 years older than me and they got me into all kinds of stuff like cows, Jesus lizard, drive like Jehu, neurosis, today's the day. And like, this is when I was a teenager, which a lot of the time at, back then, those were bands that people in their twenties were enjoying. So it, uh, it fucked us up real early. And then of course <laughs> I get my brother into these bands and, and our bassist that we were working with way back in the day, he grew up with me. So we were all listening to the same kind of material, um, which I mean, yeah, n- not a lot of people that are 15 were listening to that stuff. No, not at all. When I got into hardcore, I was listening to, well, Dillinger, Converge, Cave In, Colesque. And then a couple years later, you know, Newfound Glory, Piebald, Texas is the Reason, like all the, the emo classics. It was very... It was very regimented. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah, this column and this column, and that's it. Yeah, and I've, I've just been messed up since I was like 13. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know when Dillinger was coming up, I I exchanged messages, I think, with Ben Wyman because I was astonished um, that a band was doing something like what the Dazzling Killmen were doing, only making it more extreme. And he was surprised I knew who they were. <laughs> which I, I thought was really cool. And I mean, I love that he's not much older than I am, but yeah, the, that, that's kind of where I was coming from. It's like, this band sounds like dazzling kill men mixed with dead guy. And not a lot of people my age would get references like that. I mean, dead guy kind of has had a resurgence way after the fact. And just by proxy of being on victory, they, they certainly had connections to hardcore, but that, that seemed to, continue to to circulate over the years but yeah it generally speaking wasn't uh wasn't music for younger kids okay so ken mode is together we're playing right we're we're, we've got a debut record on escape artist a fantastic label right yeah a very underappreciated label in my opinion i don't think they put out a single bad record um and actually, the the whole escape artist thing came together because of Damien from Playing Enemy. He discovered us on MP3.com, like way back in, it had to have been 2000. And I, I, I corresponded with him way back then, because that was around when Playing Enemy was putting out their debut record on escape artist. And he connected us with them and, and 
to this day, like the connection to escape artist is, I'd say, for sure, the most important music industry connection we've ever made. Because it's just, it's continued on. Because Gordon, who was one of the guys who ran Escape Artist at the time, was also running Relapse Records. And when we signed with Season of Mist, he just so happened to get hired by them to manage their U.S. operations. So we've been working with Gordon now for 20 years. Oh, wow. That just goes to show you the relationships you make. I mean, they really carry you in this business. Yeah. And that that, uh, also kind of circles back to when you were asking about when we shifted our gears to doing our management company. Like the only reason we were even able to get this off the ground was the connections we made through the music industry. Like when we first started doing it, we were open to working with kind of like local bands and local companies. But for the most part, we work with very few people out of Winnipeg. Like almost everyone is all spread across Canada. And it's it's connections we made through our band, through managers that have worked with labels that Ken Mode's worked with. Like it's all this weird inbred scene that everyone works with everyone. And that's that's the only way we've been able to patch this all together. And it's it's all comes back to Ken Mode. It's incredible how that works, right? I was thinking about this recently. Three years ago, I didn't know anybody. And well, I knew my friends and their bands, and that's about it. But three years later, I have uh, an amazing Rolodex now and different opportunities. And it's it's just, uh, yeah, it's a business of relationships. And in the end, like it's all, it's connecting a bunch of nerds worldwide, right? (laughs) The only reason any of us give a shit about any of this is because we're just a bunch of music nerds. We love this stuff more than anything else. And when you meet other people who love the same things as you do, you just, you can't help but geek out with them. And then you become pals. It's, and that's one of the most beautiful and heartwarming things about this whole mess of a, a community. And it it exists all over the world. And that's one of the best reasons we still tour is to get to reconnect with all those people we've met. That and I I love just eating food, cool food. (laughs) I don't even care about playing. I don't want to play. I want to eat and hang out. That's about it. What is your uh, go-to food when you're in New York City? I think I know the answer, but I'm going to listen and and hope that you say it. (sighs) <sighs> I might get into trouble here. We almost never have the opportunity to actually eat anything good in New York City because it's always such a rush and we have ah. a tendency to get out of the city right after we play because we don't want to get stuck in traffic. So, right. yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it's going to be disappointing. We usually just try to cram tacos in our face or like last time we ate a sandwich from across the street at the bodega by St. Vitus. Like, oh, that place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which like it was good for an after yeah. for something that's open after a show. I had zero complaints. But yeah, we we never get to eat in New York, like really eat. And this time we actually had our transmission was going out. uh Oh no. Like right before our Philadelphia show. So that that whole weekend was kind of marred in in van issues and frantically seeing if we could troubleshoot it and then by actually it was actually the day after the New York show we died on the way to Boston and had to leave the van and figure that all out. Oh man. Yeah, good times. That's that's life on the road, right? Yeah, always uh problem solving on the fly. Well, pizza is great here. If you ever get the chance to go to a good pizza spot, I mean, this is the place to eat it. So I hear. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna hate me for this one though. I I hate cheese. Oh, really? Yep. I get uh, so much flack for that. So I don't eat pizza. Okay. I I'm I'm not a big cheese fan. I I only like it in certain instances. Pizza being one of those. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you know, if people see me picking cheese off a sandwich, they're like, oh, uh, and I'm like, why? Why are you affected by how I eat? Yeah. Like why yeah. do you why do you care? That's strange to me. Uh, but, and yet we're all guilty of it, right? <laughs> like I, yeah. I yeah. Whenever I tell people I, I dislike cheese, people react like I said something racist. <laughs> it's, it's it's always so weird. It's really funny. And I mean, it's it's entertaining that people are that passionate about cheese. And I mean, I yeah, I, I get it. There are foods that I'm that passionate about, but yeah. Dairy. uh, And I mean, it's not even a dairy thing with me. It's just a cheese thing. For some reason, it just it's disgusting. Yeah, I don't I don't care about cheese at all. I don't look for it. And I've I've had that same experience you're talking about. And I I just don't understand about getting upset about 
what someone else eats or, you know, I don't care about food. Food eating is like a chore to me. I just want to get it done and get it out of the way. Oh, see, that's, that's something we differ on though. I, I love food. Oh, in fact, are you like a foodie? What could we could describe you as a foodie? Ish. Yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. I mean, I, I'm not one of those people who like takes pictures of my food all the time and logs it. And, but I, I am deeply affected by food. Like I, it's funny on tour, you're forced to be adventurous because you simply don't know the the surroundings that you're in and you're always unfamiliar with your possibilities of where you can eat at home. I'm super risk averse because like if I have a bad meal, it'll ruin my night slash day. So I, I end up kind of getting locked into patterns, but, but food is, yeah, it's, it's very important to me. <laughs> it has to be good or I'm going to be a baby. <laughs> No, that makes sense. Like when I'm when I travel, when I'm out of New York City, I usually won't eat as much because I'm very locked into the things I eat here, which it, it's not great. I don't eat great. I eat like local pizza, frozen pizza, a lot of but I don't know. It's just like I can't get good bagels outside of New York City. The breakfast doesn't taste the same and that's like my main meal of the day, so uh I won't eat as much. I mean, I get that for sure. Like yeah, breakfast joints if if breakfast is your big thing and yeah, with bagels in New York, you're not you're not going to get anywhere that that's going to compare. And with breakfast Nowhere. food, I don't know. It's it it's can be so hit and miss. And, and this is as someone who's traveled a, a lot just very recently. Yeah, you start to get sick of how just bland everything can be. And if you're used to things that like as a breakfast pops, your life is going to suck at some pretty mediocre diners. <laughs> I didn't know that bagels were a thing until I moved here in 2012. I was just eating Dunkin' Donuts bagels, which is just, that's that's not bagels, but that's all I knew. And then I ate a real bagel here and it was like a religious experience and I, <laughs> I can never go back. <laughs> Your bagel world has been shattered. <laughs> so, Ken Mode is playing. We've got our first full length out on classic label, Escape Artist. Talk about the band and shows at that time. I mean, how was the reception to the band? How were things going? Were you touring a lot? Because I don't know, I, at least when I was young, I mean, I kind of had my head in the sand. I would only listen to certain things or my friend's bands. I did not have such a diverse musical palette like yourself. Talk about the scene at that time and shows you were playing and the reception to your band. The scene, it was. It, I mean, it was a very interesting time. Um, the first time we toured... We we really honestly we didn't tour that much when we were younger, which is we kind of did everything the inverse of the way bands are supposed to do it. We went to university while everyone else was out on tour, and by the time everyone else was burning out, we had day jobs and were sick of it and wanted to go on tour. So we we started putting in our more heavy touring near our the end of our twenties and early thirties, as opposed to at like twenty one. But we did tour when we, we put out our first record. We did a, a Western Canadian run in 2002 with, remember that band The End on uh, oh yes on Relapse? They were the first band to take us out on tour. And that was just a Canadian one. But then we did a follow-up when we put our record out, a US tour in 2003. And uh, that one was entertaining because like we'd never experienced, experienced much of the US ever before. And by going down and touring a lot of the people we'd been in touch with online were getting shocked by how young we were. Cause like at the time Shane couldn't even legally play in bars. So yeah, it was a, it was a strange time, but there was at the same time, there was a lot of really great music being made. Like we got to play with bands like Anodyne and burnt by the sun and uh, getting to do stuff like that in the U S was so cool. And I mean, a lot of those bands are still some of my favorite bands, but... Yeah, The End is incredible. We used to see them all the time. We had a whole scene going on in Bucks County, uh, just north of Philly, mm -hmm. and they would come down all the time. We would hang out with them. They would play shows. They were unbelievably good. Yeah, I know they kind of relentlessly went after Philly because they, they wanted to get signed to Relapse so bad. I remember hearing stories about that <laughs> those times. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like desperately. We got to keep playing Philly. We got to get relapsed up. We got to get signed. <laughs> they did eventually, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they yeah, were. I, I remember they were obsessed with Dillinger Escape, or some of them were obsessed with Dillinger Escape Plan, just like I was. And I I had the original uh, 
running board hoodie. I still have it actually. And mm. someone in the band wanted it. And I was like, nope. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's uh yeah, I see I forget about all of these bands like uh Anodyne, Burnt by the Sun, I've gone back and listened to a couple of times. There was like there was some good, uh, slightly more avant-garde stuff going on, like outside of all the melodic stuff and everything else. Yeah, and bands like Playing Enemy, who I'd mentioned before, like, and it was it was that Hydra Head escape artist scene. Yes, but at this, like, despite us being on escape artist, I felt like we never really fit in with that kind of whole art metal scene, and it's probably just because we were younger than everyone else. But I don't know. I don't know. We, I've, there's been a part of it that I've always felt like we were outsiders to all the stuff that was going on. Was that because we're Canadian? Maybe. Um, is it because people just think we suck? Maybe. I don't know. I don't care. We're still doing our thing. But I mean, the fact that we fit in on Escape Artist has always been some like a feather that I put in my cap. So whatever. Uh, how long did you feel like that? I mean, did that ever go away? We still feel like outsiders, yeah. And we still get treated like outsiders, so that's fine. How so? Uh, the industry's a funny and fickle thing, and everyone chases hype, right? And at this point, we've been a band for 23 years, so there's nothing hype about us. But I, I've always felt uncool, despite the fact that essentially all of the people involved in this community gravitated toward it because none of us were cool right and yet then people form cool clubs within the uncool kids it's just so ridiculous the the cliqueiness of of everyone all the time but yeah i i've i've never felt like we fit in particularly the and and now that uh, we have a little bit more of a profile it's funny with bands that are smaller than us thinking that we're bigger than we are and that we maybe have more pull than we do i don't know they're they're always surprised that we're like quote down to earth or like into like being a part of this smaller community cuz we're we're just we don't have delusions of what's going on no, no nobody <laughs> in the cool club wants us there anyway no uh you sound like you have a level head about it and i'm just curious about your mindset because my whole life i just always felt outside and was really hard on myself and I just remind myself now, like, what you're doing is cool. Don't worry about anything else. Just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, it, I mean, it looks like that's what you guys are doing, too. And I, I think that's great. Yeah, almost in spite of everyone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hear you, though, with the clicks and the weird. I When you get up to certain levels, like, there's very cool people, but there's very, like, petty nonsense, too. Like, I remember the last gig I played. This was with people I knew. And they were they were acting too cool, and they were nobodies. Like they're like, oh, what, what's this band you're in? Like what? And I'm like, what the fuck do you mean? What is this? Band? Like, and then we didn't get paid for the show. We didn't get any drink tickets. Like everybody's like acting all weird. And this is from people I know. So yeah. I I just don't I I don't understand people acting like weirdos or big shots, especially when they have no place doing it. Yeah, I guess some people. The moment anyone gives them any praise, they just start smelling their own farts. And then they get high on their own farts. And then all they want to do is smell their own farts. And I mean, I get it. I guess if you think your farts smell good, it can be an interesting cycle of a pleasurable (laughs) cycle. But like, if you take a step back, you note what you're actually doing there. And it's it's not very cool. (laughs) You know, everyone else sees you sitting there smelling your own farts. I don't know, man. I see how it could be. Uh, I guess I see how you could get sucked into that, you know, but it's just gross. I, I I always remind myself, like, look, you're not the shit, you know, take your ego out of it. Uh, be nice, be respectful, move forward. I think that's the way to go. Amen to that. Yeah, just uh, it all boils down to like the root of all this is we're all a bunch of losers. <laughs> we came to this because no one liked us and there was something wrong with our brain embrace everybody i don't know (laughs) it's very important to remember that that's why yes that's why i got involved with this sounds like that's why you got involved with this too and to begin with yep exactly something wrong with us we didn't fit in now we're here (laughs) we've got a couple more friends than we otherwise would (laughs) have uh so ken mode continues on we do the 
2011 to 2016 full-time grind, right? Yep. And talk about how do you decide to not be full-time anymore? What's the conversation? What's going on in your lives? Set the stage for us. Just exhaustion at that yeah. point. Um, that and our success record uh, really wasn't received very well. Um, we kind of got we got panned by Pitchfork right when it came out, and it seemed like all the other it, you see this happen all the time in the kind of like bigger underground press when one person expresses an opinion, then everyone copies it. So we we got universally panned by the hipster press who had kind of jumped on board with us the the previous record, and it seems as though we got dropped by our agent right when the album came out. So we had like no help from anyone and it seemed for some reason, like we became just like poison in terms of being like a support band for larger tours too. So like no one wanted to tour with us. All the press hated the record. I booked like months worth of touring on my own and we just ultimately burnt out. (laughs) What was people's beef with the record? I don't know. I think it's like, it was very clearly, uh, more of a straight noise rock record as a poise as a poise to as a poise to some sort of hardcore thing yeah i don't know <laughs> it, it it definitely was more of a nod to a lot of the bands that got me into wanting to play in a band in the first place but we we just felt like doing something different and i don't know i guess people didn't want to hear that from us at the time that's fine it it was something we felt we needed to do so And we had fun making it, and I still think it's a good record. But, uh, yeah, I guess hindsight being twenty twenty, maybe a career misstep. Who knows what what would have happened if we did something different? I don't know. Yeah, and you know, I think ultimately being true to yourself, which it sounds like you and the band are, is the way to go. It's not like it's not like you said, okay, we're gonna set out and do X to be more commercially successful or, oh, we're going to strategize. And no, like you, that was where you were at the time and you did what was in your heart, right? Yeah, that was, it was the artistic move we wanted to make. And yeah, I guess it was commercially the wrong one. That's fine. (laughs) I mean, there's no way to, there's no way to really anticipate that because there's a million bands who changed their sound and exploded. And then there's bands who stay the same and died. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. And ultimately with all this stuff, like we, we never envisioned being career musicians anyway. Like this, this is a hundred percent an artistic and ego stroke job. And it will always be that. And as our, our main goal was that we ultimately don't have to constantly continue to funnel our own money into it and lose money on it. And it seems as though we've kind of made it there. So I guess we've succeeded, which is awesome. I can record records with some of the coolest producers in our little weird world and not lose my ass on it. That's the dream to me, honestly, because in this world of music that you and I are operating in, there's no, I mean, bands like Turnstile, Knocked Loose, that's like that's like a one in a million shot. That's like a pipe dream. To me, the dream is like, I can do this thing and not go into severe debt. Yeah. That's the dream. And ultimately, like all the artists that I really like that are going on right now, none of them are popular at all. So <laughs> all the artistic uh, high watermarks for me are considerably smaller bands than we are. So I guess we've achieved something that was unexpected from that perspective for me. Um, yeah. And I, and I have to remind myself how important that is to our journey that, and I mean, you constantly forget about that when, when you kind of, cause we're, we're, we're in this horrible cyclical culture with social media where we're comparing ourselves to only the best and most successful of everyone. So you kind of beat yourself down with this degree of expectation when, if you're keeping it real, like. Yeah, no no one should know who we are outside of Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> and people do. Yeah. I mean they do. I mean I'm I'm looking at booking another European tour. Why should anyone in France care about what I'm doing? 
<laughs> it's pretty incredible, right? Like I'll I'll look at stats for this podcast and the growing number of countries that I see where people are listening and I'm like, "Oh my god." Like that's wow. Never expected that. And I mean, that's the as as we both lamented about in the beginning of this, like the internet it, it's the the dual uh utopia and dystopia, right? Some some things are are better than they ever have been with the ability to communicate worldwide, which, uh, I mean, that's how I got into this music in the first place was the, the beginnings of the internet in the 90s. Like you find a weird site that some crazy person created because he just loved the cows and cop shoot cop and unsane more than anything. Like why, <laughs> why a website dedicated to those three bands? <laughs> but I found it and then I became a fan of those bands. Like, yeah. I love that. I, I you're you saying that is like bringing back these memories now. You know, like those uh GeoCities pages and the depths of the internet and yeah, th- th- that's good stuff. It feels weird and slimy and gross lamenting uh and looking back with rosy colored glasses about the the basically the birth of the internet before it was like the most mainstream of mainstream. Like obviously like everyone is online now, but like in the early late nineties, early two thousands, like it was mostly nerds that were on there. Yeah. So it, and when that is the case, there's a certain uniqueness about the culture. And I think that's why a lot of the, a lot of us who were online in those times do look back with fondness because it was a very strange time. <laughs> Cause there were Big only, time. only strange people on there. Yeah. Like I, I spent my entire life on AIM, Instant Messenger. Like that's all I did. Six and I was boards. fucking weird. Ugh. Yeah. Message board. I still post on message boards. I think I stopped finally. I can't You're remember. Done? Yeah. I, I don't remember the last message board I actually post on or posted uh, on rather. But yeah, I'm down to one. That's impressive. What but is it? it? It's, it's, I, I can't talk about it. The first ah, rule of the message. Ah, it's secret a, one. It, it's a it's a left it's it used to be a records label it used to be a record labels message board and then there was a division and then everybody like went and formed a private message board this isn't the relapse board is it no okay no. i i'm guessing this has happened at a lot of different yeah you know, yeah yeah this is, um, this has probably happened at every record labels message board but basically this group of people has been posting together since the year 2000 which is pretty wild that's funny. Yeah, I know the the relapse yeah. board was the same way, and uh, yeah, they there was a division, and then someone started one called the relapse board, and everyone moved <laughs> there. Yeah, that, and I mean that's where I met a lot of people in this community. Ah, <laughs> uh, I'm. Uh, you know what? This is amazing to hear that this happens at other record labels. I I'm happy to hear this. Yeah, the relapse board was wild back in the day. Okay, so we're scaling down on full-time Ken mode. We're starting the business. What do you do? Do you sit down with your brother and make a business plan? Do you do you, like start calling old friends and colleagues to get a client list together? What do you do? I'm I don't really remember. I I kind of pitched the idea to him like we got to figure out something to do. Should we try applying our our educations to the scene that we're a part of? That's really the extent of it, because we didn't, we both didn't know what the hell to do with our lives, and we, and we needed to make money. And our our parents had already had like a sh- well, they'd been running a consulting company for at that point sixteen years, so they incorporated the name MKM Management Services. And when we wanted to start doing this, they were starting to ramp down into retirement, so they pitched to us that we could just take it over. Mostly like just the incorporated entity and all the the infrastructure that went with it, like the server, the bank accounts, blah, 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 blah. So it would make at least starting for us a little bit easier. Yeah. And then we just, we kind of tried to take a run at it. Uh, I, I don't feel like there was necessarily even much of a plan behind it. Like we weren't super organized in how we a- attacked the whole thing, but it uh, it just kind of kept snowballing, which I I... I mean, as with everything in my life that has dealt with music, I feel fortunate for the way things have panned out. So you just started doing it, and now it's working. Yeah, and it started working pretty quickly. And I think a a good part of that is because 
we we had a reputation for being not full of shit and yeah. and trustworthy and as we started getting more client work the word spread very quickly uh especially with this we wanted to work within underground music and especially the community that we're a part of so anyone with any skills like actual business skills i think are kind of treasured in that community because there's not very many of us so i think yeah. the word spread pretty quickly that like yeah if you need help with that the ken mode guys do that get in touch with them <laughs> And the moment you know a couple of people at labels and managers, then they start funneling everyone toward you. So, yeah, it uh, it definitely started to snowball for us in that regard. I think we're we're making a, a an okay living within like two years of starting. Which, I mean, I can't complain about that. Yeah, that beats uh, life out in a van, right? Not making yeah. money. Yeah. And I mean, we always had this like running joke that like, we just want sushi money. We want to be able to eat sushi once a week. We just want to be comfortable yeah. so we can eat sushi once a week. And uh, when you're on tour, you don't make sushi money. So no, no, that's a, that was my dream. I said, I just want to make enough t- that I can order my meal through U- Uber Eats every single day. <laughs> Which and is I not, do then? yeah, that's, that's a, that's a feat. That's I am hemorrhaging cheap. money, <laughs> but I don't care because I don't want to cook. I just I just want the food to come. I want to eat it and I want to be done and back back to work. Yeah, I feel you there. What do you do outside of the podcast? I work for an outsourcing firm. Um, I have been with this company for a very long time, and it was a. I had no plan. I had no college degree. You know, I just took the first job I could find on Craigslist. Mm-hmm. So I start, it was basically like a mail room to much higher position story over the course of many years. Cool. The fact that that still exists is is cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, when I visit people at sites, I tell them sometimes if it comes up, I'm like, look, if you apply yourself there, there is opportunities. Um, so I do consulting as well. Very cool. Yeah. Business consulting. What a world, eh? You know, it's, uh, it's not bad. I, I, I used to do project management. And I had a much more intense job and I was traveling constantly and I hated it. But now I'm not traveling nearly as much and it's just a lot of email and phone calls and Teams meetings. And I work from home 90% of the time. And I like that a lot more. Yeah, yeah. The the traveling That's the way to beats, do it. Tra- the traveling side beats everyone up. And that, I mean, obviously everyone knows that of, of the touring lifestyle. But the older yeah. we get... I I start to understand why older bands waste so much money because the comfort thing is what kind of kills you on tour and the lack of sleep. I mean that's that's always been the worst part, but it's a necessity though when you get older. Yeah, you get crotchety when you're not comfy. I want to be comfy. Exactly. Do you have to travel at all for your gig now? Uh, no. And that's that's another kind of awesome aspect of the internet, like. I don't know, 15 years ago, you never would have been able to do what we do from Winnipeg. Like you'd have to move to Toronto, New York, LA, somewhere where you're like right in the middle of large center music industry bullshit. And because of the fact that uh, being face to face with clients does not matter at all, um, we can stay in the middle of nowhere and it doesn't matter. And if anything, it allows us to probably be a little cheaper than people in like places like Toronto. So I think it plays to our advantage. Like I, I have an office out of my parents' basement because who cares, right? I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather pocket all that money than pay for some expensive office in downtown Toronto to look cool. I've never been cool. Why should I pretend now? <laughs> yeah, the optics are gone, which is great because it can save you a lot of money. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's another thing that we, we've laughed about historically as a band, like not being cool has always hurt us. And now we get paid to not be cool. So I'll take it. <laughs> the band just put out another great record last year. Noel. Yep. Yep. And let's uh, talk about this. Are we happy with the record? Were people happy with the record? I was happy with the record. I think we get better every time we put out a record we get better at executing the vision. Um, obviously, the vision this time was a, a, a heavy 
personal experience because it was coming through the pandemic. This this was the first of two records that were written and recorded during the pandemic. So, so this was actually written during the pandemic. Yeah. We started to write again late 2019, early 2020, and then the pandemic hit and I threw all of that in the garbage because none, of it, none of it meant anything to me anymore. Ah, I see. You know, I've heard of bands doing this where you're working on something, something big happens, and you just completely change everything you're doing. And that that sounds Flighty. that sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just sounds scary to me because it's so hard for me to sit down and write lyrics and music and everything. I can't imagine like throwing stuff away and starting over, but but I really respect it because it means like you're really in the moment. Yeah. And I mean, that was part of the problem because like the pandemic obviously affected everyone. So the stuff we were doing prior to it just did not feel in the moment anymore. And that whole feeling ended up becoming an overarching concern of the whole project. Um, us even trying to record the material that we would put together over the, the two year cycle, it, although it was more or less like a year and a half of writing. Um, but I didn't want to wait to have to record it because we were trying to bring Andrew Schneider, who recorded and produced our loved record. We wanted to bring him up to Winnipeg to record this batch of material. And um, initially, we wanted to do it in the summer of 2021. But when we were making the decision to buy plane tickets, we had to do kind of a cutoff date of May 2021, where we went like, we still can't get him into Canada legally. So we're going to have to push this back again. And in that discussion, we had to come up with like a contingency plan. Like if we can't get him in in the fall, what are we going to do? Because I didn't want to wait any longer because at that point, like some of the songs that were written in the earlier part of 2020 would have felt irrelevant to me. Like it, it was very much part of the experience of what we'd all been through and i i just didn't want that to drift and that is one of the awful parts of the way the record industry is right now with vinyl pushing back everyone's timelines like null well null and void which is coming out this year were both finished and submitted january 2022 oh wow we had to wait till late September to have Null finally come out. So we had LPs and because we'd made two records, I, I felt like it would have been a commercial suicide to put them both out as like a double thing. Cause I, I didn't think anyone would listen to it. Yeah. You know, a lot of bands do that now and they're like, Oh, smashing pumpkins, melancholy and the infinite sadness. But I, I think it's like overdone now. Yeah. And I don't know. A lot of a lot of the time when bands do that, there is a fair amount of throwaway material. Um yeah. and we wanted people to actually pay attention to these songs because I mean the the pandemic being what it was, people were either paralyzed with their circumstance and unable to produce anything, or a flood of material came out. And I mean, I was I was fortunate enough that circumstance allowed me to create a flood with this. And between myself working alone and in the times that I was able to get together with my bandmates, we, we put together about 75 minutes worth of material that we felt strongly about to to want to record, spend a bunch of money recording it and and put it out. So we we were able to separate it into two distinct records that fit together as a whole yet at the same time stand alone as two distinct records with two distinct personalities so um it, it'll be interesting and, and exciting to see how void is received this year because i i do think no it gave us a little bit more of a profile than our last record had which is cool i'm 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 very happy with the fact that we haven't become completely irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually learned like home recording, right? To put all these demos together during the pandemic. Yeah. 
that was that was my first project in the pandemic was how how the hell am I going to play music when we can't get together? So I'd flirted with the idea of recording on my computer in like 2007. And the technological climate has changed considerably since then. It is so much easier to do the thing. So that and just my crowdsourcing for information. I know so many brilliant producers that like, are just on my Facebook friends. Like, so the fact that I can go like, Hey, I'm looking at like kind of a starter monitor thing. And Kurt Ballou will tell me like, I think these are the best ones you should do. They're the best bang for your buck. And it's like, I don't deserve that kind of access, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take advantage of it. It rules. Like I, I'm thinking of getting like a compressor and maybe a, a mic preamp, like, and to have, Andrew Schneider tell me like, yeah, this is probably, this will get you through that. Like some, it, it's moments like that where I sit back and go like, I, 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 I have things pretty cool sometimes. <laughs> yes. You have the access. Like think about how much time you save just by being able to ask these individuals, Hey, where's a good place to start? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that, that did allow me to kind of jump in. And, and the fact that like everyone was in lockdown, nobody knew what was going on with their jobs. I mean, I work in the music industry, so everything we were doing just came to a grinding halt. So I was afforded the time to kind of dive in and teach myself how to program MIDI and and work on... I, I was working on Reaper, and I still honestly am. I haven't jumped over to, to Pro Tools or anything, even though I probably should. But yeah, I, I was afforded the time to teach myself how to use all that, and I taught myself how to start demoing things on my own and began piecing songs together that way, which obviously that's something I want to continue using because it was pretty great. Yeah. I mean, to be able to put the, that's something I'd like to do. I'd like to put a whole song together to bring to the band because I feel like that will save time rather than us sitting in the practice space, like hammering away at it. Yeah, it definitely saved time. It, it also takes away anyone else's ability to provide input, but... <laughs> That's much- secretly a- another thing I want. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's that's one of the interesting things about all the, the batch of material that we produced over this amount of time. Like about half of it I came up with on my own. And then the other half we did as a band, which yeah. was neat. And it, 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 it gives the songs a certain personality. But obviously the, the biggest thing for me through teaching myself how to use these these tools is we got to approach additional instrumentation in a different manner than we had before. I I've always wanted to add different instruments to kind of the, the noise rock, hardcore, whatever the hell we are mold. But most of the time we write the songs as a three piece unit and try to add these things in at the last minute in the studio and a lot of the time there's just not any room for that kind of experimentation to for it to actually work properly like it it's a sort of thing that you should think out when you're coming up with the the riffs and and song structures themselves in the first place so i got to do that this time like i'd write the riffs with the fact that i want to put a synth part in mind off the hop or Rather than, okay, I covered this song in vocals. No, this part's going to have a saxophone line that's doing this. And that really opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me, which, I mean, duh, right? But it's, it's, it's definitely a breath of fresh air into a project that's been going for 23 years now. And uh, I really need to get some inspiration going again to start creating things that I feel passionate about again, because I'd like to dive back into songwriting, but it's, it's been a bit of a chore. It's tough, especially nowadays, you know, the, the lethargy we're talking about, the post COVID stuff, all of that. It's, it's hard to, it's really hard for me to sit down and write a song and finish a song and finish lyrics especially yeah i i I make this mistake every album cycle too because i i have a tendency to kind of micromanage the entire promotional side too um and with null like 
mine and Shane's day jobs are busier than they've ever been. And micromanaging the promo side, like I had no time in the last year to like sit down and write music. So I haven't really accomplished anything on that side for at least a year, year and a half now. And I'm, I'm trying to get back into it. And when you, you stand there trying to play guitar and just nothing is coming out that you like, it's such a defeating feeling. And now I also have a whole other album cycle staring me down going, Hey, so dude, what are we going to do? <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh God, I don't want to think about music videos again. I hate music videos. Yeah. I, you know, I like what bands are doing now though. Just do like this visual accompaniment thing, a visualizer thing. I, I I'm into that because I don't know, just if you have the time and the budget to do a whole video with the storyline and you have a great idea, that's great. But if you don't, you know, like these visualizer things are pretty cool, I think. Yeah, the visualizer is almost the smartest route for bang for your buck. Yeah. Our videos don't get viewed that much. I, I, If we get money for them, I like to make them something unique. But at the same time, within heavy music, when when people take the the videos as a storyline approach i always feel like they're just really hacky shitty mo- like indie movies yeah if you don't include any live footage or like performative aspect from the band it just feels like a half-assed movie and i <laughs> i just don't want that of a music video ever so uh, it's it's a it's a tough one for me because I I very much prefer getting to see what the band looks like, having the band perform, but then you can't do too much of that either because it gets boring. I, with music videos, I feel like it's really really easy to make a bad one. So oh, yeah, you, very you, much. You so. just have to be very careful. I uh, with this with the null cycle, I feel like we made the best videos we've ever had, but I don't want to replicate that because it took a lot of time. And, <laughs> and I, yeah, a lot of time, a lot of effort and it it wasn't cheap and I just don't want to do that again. I don't have the, en- I don't have the energy to manage it right now. You said when you're writing Noel, you know, you take all the existing material and you throw it out because there's this unfamiliar new world where we are dealing with, what did you write about? What are you processing at the time? Uh, just a lot of the emotional tension the fury that's circulating everywhere the the fear and franticness of the unknown i think a lot of the, those sentiments were what was picked up on the null material the the music itself was much more oppressive sounding very dense and chaotic and then the a lot of the void material that's coming out this year reflects more of the 2021 sentiments where there's like a, a melancholy and sadness about it and just a deep and resentful disappointment in everyone and everything. And it's been entertaining because not, not very many people have heard it yet. And uh, my, my, I sent it to my friend Shane who uh, plays in the band great falls and also writes for decibel. And he gave me a, a really a great pull quote that I, I should uh, I should just read verbatim. He said that he's going to have to listen to this a couple more times, but like he was told, this is way more melancholy and just a huge bummer. Not Definitely not your standard Ken mode, the most post-rock you've ever been. And he said that Scott's bass work really shines, but it's all pretty fucking sad, though. It's like the, <laughs> it's like the first record is you fighting, and this one is you losing. Wow. I, I can't wait to hear that. I love the sound of that. I love bummer music. I live on it. <laughs> Me too. Wow. Yeah. I you know what? 2021 will forever be to me like a horrible year. There was just a lot of bad stuff going on um and post-covid processing and all that stuff. So I would love to hear uh, the musical accompaniment of Ken Mode to that. Well, it'll start slowly being released throughout the year. I think we're going to do even more singles for this one just to kind of perpetuate the null cycle too because we're we're doing a west coast run in march that i think we'll release a single for and then we've got roadburn in april 
that I think we'll release another single for. And then we'll kind of launch the record and just kind of keep the ball rolling forward. I, it, it, we'll see how this all works out from a promotional standpoint, because I, I feel like by extending the, the window of, of this cycle with singles, it does kind of prop up null too. So people don't just forget about it, which is nice because it's all meant to be part of one overarching statement anyway. So, and with everything, I'm just, I'm curious how it's going to play out, how people are going to like it or if they're going to hate it. I don't know. We did it. It's coming. So it doesn't matter. With the description you just read, I don't think anyone can or should hate it. Who knows though? Yeah. Who knows? It's, uh, it's got a lot of the same elements of the previous one, just being treated differently. We've still got saxophone. We've got piano. We've got some cool stuff going on, but it's definitely sadder. (laughs) Sadder is good. I'm into that. I have to figure out where we go from here now. Where do we go? I don't know. <laughs> Full on post rock record, or you could you remember when hardcore bands would always like turn emo or just rock. You could try that, maybe. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I think uh, <laughs> I think the next step is we got to get way more fucked up, way more yeah. fucked up. And I I don't know. I've been listening to the the last two years bands that have actually inspired me in 2021 plebeian grandstand did a record that i thought was just absolutely incredible and last year scarcity from new york records like that push metal forward for me and and those are kind of my artistic inspirations for where i want to go next not not saying that like i'm gonna rip those off but like that's like the artistic high water mark for like where I want to push things next. So how how that gets interpreted by my stupid brain and spit back out through this whatever noise rock filter, we'll we'll find out. But yeah, I'd I'd like to get more fucked up. And now that Catherine's like a proper writing member, um, because she played on both of these records and she's an actual member of our band, but like she for the most part wasn't present during a lot of the writing because like. I did it at home and then got her to come in and write saxophone parts. But like most of the other parts that she did in the studio, I wrote. So I'm, I'm curious to see where I can push her as a musician and a composer. So uh, stoked to see what happens there. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to hearing it. And yeah, I think that's what sets Ken mode apart is it doesn't necessarily sound like anything else. And you do incorporate these interesting elements, the jazz elements, piano, saxophone, all that good stuff. Yeah. I'd like to get really weird with those. That's, that's the goal. Get super weird. <laughs> yeah. I'm envisioning like some seedy, abandoned jazz bar, smoke hangs heavy in the room there. You don't know what's going to happen in there. Like there's some old jazz musicians playing. You might get stabbed. You might not. You don't know what's going to happen. And just like this cacophony of numbers floating through the air for some bizarre (laughs) reason. And people coughing and everyone's confused. The future erupts. Yep. We'll see. We'll see. (laughs) So we've got Void coming up. Is there a release date? Do we know when we can expect singles or anything else? Uh, I'm believing a single's coming in March. Um, we haven't actually officially announced the release date for void yet, but I know we said it. Um, I don't know whether I should say it or not. I don't know whether I'm allowed to. Maybe we should wait because we'll get in trouble if they, if they have to push it back, right? My show will get canceled. You'll get fired from the band. It, it'd be really bad. That would be bad for both of us. And I don't think we should do that. <laughs> we shouldn't risk it. But yeah, it's, it's going to be around... Null came out September 23rd last year. It's going to be around the same time this year because I, I wanted like a year apart. So if that changes, that'll suck. But that's that's when it's supposed to be. Cool. And you have uh, tour dates coming up in March, correct? We do. We're finally going back to California. It's been uh, entertaining because we didn't get to tour very much for our loved record, partially thanks to the pandemic. Um, but we're we've been getting to a bunch of places in america that we didn't in many many years since our success tour in 2015 so yeah we haven't been down to california and coming up on eight years so 
it'll be nice to to get to go down there and hopefully it's not terrible you never know that's that's been the funniest part of all this like uh on this last tour that we did in the US, we went to places like Nashville and I don't think we'd played Nashville since 2010 and it was great. So, yeah, I, sometimes I just don't know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to eat when you're in California? Just burritos, constant yes. tacos and burritos. Yes. In fact, I'm kind of disappointed that we didn't eat more of that when we were in Texas, but yeah, we did go to a barbecue joint, so I'm happy about that. But yeah, even that, like I used to have the capacity to eat a lot more barbecue on tour. And I think being old and broken, I don't need Texas barbecue for a couple of years. That was <laughs> that was a bit much. It was delicious, but it was a bit much. One of the last times I was in California, you know, I always thought like the California Mexican food thing was hyped, but I went to this restaurant. Might have been in Northern California, so I don't know. One one of the Californias went to a restaurant with a coworker. They had this cheese dip. You, like you put the the nacho chips in the cheese. It was like this white cheese, melted cheese. Now I'm not a big cheese fan. I'm not, but I ate this cheese, and I still think about it. <laughs> and this is this is like five years later. And I had guacamole. I, it was the best guacamole I've ever had. I came back to New York and went to a Mexican restaurant that I usually go to, and I ate the guacamole, and I was so sad. That's I funny. was so sad, and I was like, oh, it, the hype is true. So the, the Mexican food really, really is amazing there. Those are the experiences that make everything special, though. Like I, yeah. I will never forget having... And I only found out about like after the fact that it was some like special chef that did it. But like the first time we played South by Southwest in 2011, I had some taco truck that was just absolutely incredible. And I ended up finding out a couple years later that it was some dude who's not from Austin, brought a truck there. And it's like, well, that that all kind of makes sense because it, it was one of those taco experiences that like I'm talking about it now, like 12 years later. And I mean, I've I've had those types of experiences in California too. We had a, what was it? I think it was a shrimp taco joint in L.A. I think it was the first time we played in L.A. And yeah, it was it was incredible. I got I need to do some advanced research on where to eat when we're down there for sure. You know, the, those food moments. Now that I'm thinking about it, are so special because I generally don't care about eating too much. But it's great. I was at a restaurant with my family. This past weekend, and we got an appetizer. It was bacon wrapped shrimp, and the shrimp was stuffed with crab. Good lord! And I, I don't even really like shrimp or crab, but I'm still thinking about that <laughs> piece of food that I ate, and that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. The last tour we did, um, and this was part of like the the pre tour research coming into play. The guys in chat chat pile told us of a. Laotian place to hit in Oklahoma City when we were there and honestly that was like the the food highlight of the whole tour it was something special so i got i got to plan things out like that where i i talk to people about exactly where to eat cuz we 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 do like to with our drive times we try to time it so we can get like a good meal before we have to load in so we like destination food once we hit a city, you go straight to the restaurant. And when you're doing that, you're eating at like, I don't know, three, four in the afternoon, maybe even before than that, before that. So there's never any lineups or anything. So you end up really getting into some pretty cool places if you can. So yeah, I I gotta do that with California. <laughs> gotta <laughs> you gotta have get to. gotta get those tacos. I need You gotta that. get that guac, man, yeah. and the tacos. I got to have that that life-altering guac. <laughs> well, Jesse, I'm looking forward to the new album. You know, you guys have just made a lot of great music over the years that I appreciate and that many people do. So I want to say thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having us. And hopefully we can continue to do things that don't suck. Uh, it's going to happen. It will. You don't know that, though. Maybe this one <laughs> sucks. Maybe this was the last good one. Look, before we before we conclude, I just want to say something about Pitchfork. Look at all the ass kissing of Kanye West they did over the years and look look where he's at now, okay? And I don't really understand the Kanye West type. And I I just had uh 
Jake Snyder from Minus the Bear on the show. Mm-hmm. And after the interview, after the re- after everything was done, I'm, I was in a Minus the Bear wormhole. I was listening to the records again, and I was just reading reviews. And I, the Pitchfork was brutal to them. Like they said some really nasty things, and I was like, "These guys are idiots. They'd have no idea what they're talking about." That's kind of their mo, though. They like prop, they like to prop people up to be the first to do it, and then when it rubs them the wrong way, they'd like to destroy them. And they do it very like personal attacky way. That's happened to countless heavy bands. I know actually Converge had it happen to them on this last one, where it, like it seemed like the write up was just full of personal attacks. It's like, what the fuck is the point of that? But I mean, at the same time, like it, it, it probably made the most impact on me because I felt like it affected that record cycle. But like in hindsight, I try not to take publications like that too seriously because, and we see this all the time where it's like the hype bands get plopped in there with like everyone else. Like, how can I take a publication seriously that gives me a good review that also puts me in the same place as Beyonce and Drake? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just, and it's it's right now it's happening to Chat Pile, which is entertaining because like they actually put out a a good noise rock record, but to see them getting put in t- like year end lists with same shit like Beyonce, like who the fuck is listening to those two records other than? The odd person who like has grown up with noise rock and kind of appreciates a lot of different music. But for the most part, the people who are doing these things are the people only chasing what's cool. And it's just, I don't know. It it doesn't make any sense to me because it's it's genre tourism. And this happened with the last daughter's record, where I'd see people mentioning us uh where oh yeah, it sounds like daughters. It's like you don't know anything about this music or where any of it comes from. So I just, it, it's, yeah, that, that whole world is just very frustrating. It, it's critiquing music that you don't know anything about. Or if you have a couple reference points, you, you, you've got, you've got everyone pegged. It's fine, fine, whatever. But it, I mean, it's, it's always hard to separate when you get really negative shit thrown at you for no reason. I still have that problem. I actually had to make a conscious effort. Like I'm, I'm done reading reviews of us period, unless people have like read them in advance and, and vetted them for me. Like we had one on this that I saw that made me vow to not read reviews anymore. And again, it was just some petty piece of shit taking like personal attacks in a band that they know nothing about where it's just like, I just, I don't get it. You don't know this music and you clearly have a bee in your bonnet about something that you're projecting on people you don't know. I'm, that's a good choice. Yeah. I'm imagining some like rich trust fund kid who knows nothing about the scene or the music. And, you know, it's like, oh, here's your assignment. And then, okay, I don't know anything about the music or the people. So let me make up these personal attacks to bring them down, which they are like the, those minus the bear reviews. Well, you know what? I don't want to mention that again. Cause I don't want to give that too much. Problem. The, the, the reviews I've read are nasty. I felt uncomfortable after reading them. Yeah. And I mean, that's the way a lot of those people operate, right? That's how they make a career. It's either glowing or scathing. And that's the way it's always been. Uh, that's how you garner attention is with the extremes. And uh, yeah, there's that too. It is always funny looking back on records that for certain communities are deemed like classics because a lot of the time such classics were universally panned when they came out, which it's always the same and it's always funny looking back. It'll never change. The cycle repeats. Yep. Well, uh, that's the second end of this episode, but you know what? <laughs> I, I'm glad that we cleared that up because uh, I'm glad that we de- dove in there because it's in, it's important to let people know. Don't let people hand you your opinion. Don't be a sucker. Forget what everybody says. Sit down with the record, listen to it, and make your own opinion. That's what I'm so happy about being 40, almost 41 now. Jesse is. I don't give. I don't look at anything. I a record comes across my desk. So and so wants to come on the show. Okay, I listen to the record. Boom, that's it. I don't only the only opinion that matters is mine. That's it. Yeah, I just want like in terms of promotion stuff. I still follow a certain number of publications that I 
no consistently feature like very up and coming like we're talking like their local band level type stuff like i know invisible oranges and brooklyn vegan has a couple people who write for them that pick up on like hardcore bands in like very regional uh ways and i w- i will listen to all that stuff just because they posted about it i will give it a shot and and but that that's that's the thing here is I don't need to read words about it. I just want a, a link. Give me a link. I'll make up my mind. And especially with like the nature of streaming, like we have no excuse to blindly follow anyone with anything anymore. Like listen to it. It's so easy. And I mean, from that aspect, it's the most exciting time to be a music fan in the history of the world. So let's, it really is. We can end this all with that. It is the most exciting time to be a music fan ever. And there you have it, Jesse Matthewson. Amazing conversation. First of all, super nice guy with a great sense of humor. He was a real pleasure to talk to. And second of all, I mean, Ken Mode has been doing this for a very long time, and they are very good at it. That whole conversation at the end about the Pitchfork review and that whole thing I felt was really interesting. And just hearing about everything they've done taking a run at the band full time for all those years. I mean, what a big risk. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to pay off. Who knows what people are going to latch on to. But have you heard their 2022 album, Knoll? Have you heard it? It's incredible. The band is stronger than ever. And have you heard Painless, the latest single they just released? Have you listened to it? It was in the beginning of the show, so I hope you did. It's really good. The next album is going to be great. I know it. And it was a real pleasure to talk to Jesse. I hope he finds all of the best food on their next upcoming tour. Thank you, Jesse. All right. So let's talk about us. How are we doing? How are we doing? How's everybody out there? I hope you're doing well. It's getting lighter out longer. I'm out at like 7, 7.30 at night and I can still see a bit of light. That's nice. It's officially spring now, even though it doesn't totally feel like it. It's warmer out. We're getting a sense of warmer weather. That's giving me some hope. But you know, I burned out this past weekend. I hit a wall. I've been going nonstop since January, working on a top secret music project. And it's taking up a lot of time, as is the podcast. And I'm getting hit from every angle, okay? Day job is super busy. Podcast is always super busy. I mean, I do this show every week and I've been recording a lot of interviews. There's a lot going on. I'm starting a band and I'm involved in another top secret music project, which has been taking up basically every weekend since January. So I hit a wall this past weekend. I haven't been giving myself any kind of break. I've been going nonstop and I woke up at five in the morning on Sunday, last Sunday. And I just, I, I just felt like everything was an obligation. It felt like everything was an attack. And I was like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta shut down before this gets any worse. So, so I turned off my phone for the entire day. I canceled everything that I could and I did nothing. And that's exactly what I needed to do. I did have one podcast interview to do on that day which uh, I usually don't do them on Sunday, but this one happened to get rescheduled for Sunday. But that interview ended up going really well, so I'm super happy about that. Can't wait to post that one. But I feel better now, and I have committed to making more time for myself. I don't know what that's going to look like exactly or how I'm going to do it, but I am going to do it. And I think it'll happen because the day job is chilling out a bit. I have a friend helping me with some podcast editing. Shout out Richie Tabor. He used to do our mixing back in the day. And now he's back, back in the fold. So that'll free up some time. And I just need to make more time for me, which I think I can do because I'm at the end of the grind for this top secret music project. So I'm heading down to Maryland for the weekend, this past weekend. And if all goes as planned, there will be an announcement soon. 
so keep your eyes out for that. That's all I can say right now. But it's exciting. There's a lot of great stuff going on. And I'm really happy. Like I mentioned last week, it's all happening. It's all happening. And it is tiring, but it's everything that I want to be doing. I just got to make a little more time for me, you know? Uh, now that I've put Warzone 2 behind me, that awful game, and I'm, you know what? Warzone 2 puts me in a bad mood. Competitive online gaming puts me in a bad mood. So this is hard to say, but I'm committed to leaving most of that behind as well. I'm getting back into some retro gaming. I want to play the Silent Hill series. I've never done that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to finish up Mario 64. I'm getting close. I want to play the original Resident Evil 3. Never played that. The Resident Evil 4 remake just came out. That looks pretty awesome. Maybe I'll try that. I don't know. Whatever whatever games I feel like playing, I'm going to play. But no online competitive stuff because it puts me in a bad mood. I'll still play the original Warzone 1, I think. But, you know, besides that, not too much. So more time for me, more chilling out, top secret project happening in Maryland this past weekend, hopefully announcement soon. That's it. That's everything that's going on. So here's a music recommendation for you for this week. The band is forming. The song is called Hate My Guts. It's a great song if you're miserable, and it's a great song if you're not miserable. The lyrical content is kind of a bummer, but the song is so upbeat that it works either way. This band put out a self-titled EP in 2010. I think they're from Florida, I think, if I remember correctly. I don't know anything about them. I don't think they ever released anything else. I don't know if they went on to do other bands. I don't know. But I discovered this EP around 2010, and I never stopped listening to it. It's really good. Check out the New Scene 2023 Spotify playlist to hear this song. You can hear the new Ken Mode single. You can hear all of our guests on that playlist as long as they're on Spotify. And I'm back next week with a new episode and a brand new guest. And listen, this is a big show. This is a band we've been trying to book for a very long time. This is a band I've been waiting to speak to since I started this podcast. This is a band I've been listening to since I got into this music. And I've got a killer guest co-host planned as well. So strap in and see you next week.